So one of the lectionary passages for the day is from the second letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. So listen to God's word as it comes from the the apostle's hand and by God's spirit, a living word for us this day. Second Corinthians four, beginning at verse five. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, speak into us earthenware vessels, clay pots, that we might know again anew afresh what treasure we have been given in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. So I I still recall the tennis match. It was in 1991 and Jimmy Connors was playing Michael Chang in the French Open. Connors, one of the greatest tennis players of his day, maybe of all time, his day included Bjorn Borg, Ilya Nastasi, John McEnroe, Connor. Connor was known, Connors was known for his, his antics. If you remember him on the court, clowning with the ball boys, he would talk to his racket when he had a wayward shot. He would entertain everyone, but he was known for being incredibly good on the court. The only man ever to win more than 100 titles in tennis. But late in that 1991, very competitive back and forth match, they were tied at at two sets apiece after Connors had, had returned in that fourth set, Connors then hobbled off the court after the first point of the fifth set. Three hours and 34 minutes into play. And he walked over to the umpire and said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just can't play anymore. Connors had to be helped to the locker room by his trainer. He, he was exhausted and his back was in tremendous pain and had stiffened up. And I still remember the commentator saying something about his being 38 years old and age was simply catching up with him. And and you know, I don't know about you, but I can't remember being young enough to think that age catches up with you at 38. (laughs) But then last weekend, I was putting up a new mailbox post And I realized at 63, it's just smarter for me to get some help at the Home Depot when I'm picking up a 50 pound bag of concrete mix. When did that happen? We have this treasure in clay jars. Clay jars are utilitarian. They're useful, but they're susceptible to chipping, to cracking, to breaking, fragile enough that eventually even some of those clay jars may no longer be worth repairing. 
Most of us know folks who will tell us that the golden years ain't always so golden. So here's, here's the context for, for Paul's word about, about these clay pots. The, the congregation in Corinth had come under the influence of some teachers who had very little regard for the apostle Paul. They themselves claimed a certain level of status and authority among the community of believers, and for this reason, they drew a straight line from faithfulness to positions of influence and prestige and power. To be faithful was to be a winner. And you and I thought the prosperity gospel was a recent invention. They didn't think much of Paul. Well, reluctantly, Paul engages them in their own game of one-upsmanship. He didn't like talking about himself or his ministry in this way. He actually called himself a fool at one point for being drawn into this kind of conversation. But he wanted his friends in Corinth to understand something about faithful commitment to Jesus and what that meant in one's life. So Paul goes ahead and he makes his boast in this letter to the Corinthians. But you know how he does so? He does so by pointing to his afflictions, to his moments of weakness, and to the raw side of servanthood. You read through the letter, Paul says, here's here's my resume, constant danger toil and hardship, sleepless nights, often without food, shipwrecked, three times beaten with rods, cold and exposure. Which is how Paul makes it very clear that it is his weakness that validates his authority. For it is, he says, in such fragile clay vessels that the treasure is carried. The suffering, rejection, and struggle, all that seem to these leaders in Corinth to diminish Paul as a human leader in their eyes, actually, Paul says, serve to reveal the extraordinary power of God, the light in the darkness. cheap earthenware vessels that you and I may be, we have the eternal power of God contained within a treasure that is not corruptible, that moths and rust and time and, and yes, even aging cannot destroy the renewing, life-giving power of Jesus Christ who was himself victorious over death and corruption. And a colleague who was telling me about recently reading this text at a memorial service for a friend of his named Dolores. And he said she was a woman with whom I had worked for more than 30 years. She was a bright, brilliant, even energetic person, except when she wasn't. Her life had been punctuated by four shattering psychotic episodes. Dolores lived with bipolar illness. And he says, Don, Dolores knew whereof Paul spoke. She knew affliction, perplexity, persecution, and being laid low, which which meant she had every single reason to give up on faith and give up on life, and she never, ever did. And he said, it wasn't until I was reading this passage in her memorial service, reading it through the lens of Dolores' life, he says, that I got it. For here in these words is the ringing note of defiance in Paul's words, afflicted but not crushed, 
perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Each phrase, he said, kind of a holy, dang it! A shout of resurrection defiance in the face of the harsh realities of life. I may be down, but I am not out. Afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. These words could describe things internal, external, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. You can hang on those four words almost any brokenness that is in this room right now. Addiction, depression, abuse, physical disease, the ravages of age, gluttony, temptation, all of them hung on those four phrases, but Paul declares, while they may knock us down, they cannot, they will not take us out. Some of you may have read or heard about Paul's writing elsewhere where he talks about having a thorn in the flesh. Some some ailment, some affliction, some disturbance, some temptation that, that Paul prays and prays and prays for God to remove from his life, but it never was. I grow more and more appreciative every day that God did not let Paul tell us what that thorn was. So that each and every one of us in our own affliction, in our own clay potness, can identify with Paul in weakness. So we can do exactly what Paul does when he feels it. To find in our weakness an opportunity to boast about God. To be reminded that the vitality of our lives does not spring up from our own ability or dedication, but from the transcendent power of God at work within us. For though this earthen pot is fragile, What God gives us, what God does in us and through us can never be defeated or crushed or stopped or destroyed. After all, Jesus too had his treasure in a clay pot, able to be struck down but not destroyed, rather raised up for the power and purpose of God in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.